think about working on a, a weapon of mass destruction, you're counting on everything to work perfect all the time. And things just don't work perfect all the time. And that was a clip from the new documentary, Command and Control, that shows us how perilously close Little Rock, Arkansas, came to being decimated in 1980 by the near explosion of the most powerful nuclear warhead ever built by the U.S., one 600 times more powerful than the bomb on Hiroshima, all due to simple human error. Here to discuss is the film's director, Robert Kenner, and the author of the book upon which the film is based, Eric Schlosser. Welcome to both of you. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Thanks for having us. Eric, let me start with you. As a writer, what drew you to those events so long ago? What drew you to looking into this deadly explosion, because there was an explosion, yeah. and getting to the bottom of what happened there? I was spending time with the Air Force, and an officer I was hanging out with told me the story of the Damascus accident. And it was just amazing to me that I had never heard this story, that someone simply dropping a tool in a missile silo could have led to not only the destruction of Little Rock, but most of the state of Arkansas with radioactive fallout up the east coast of the United States. So it was an incredible story. And the more I dug into it, the more I learned about other nuclear weapons accidents and really how challenging and difficult it is to control this very dangerous technology. Indeed, because it's all run by humans. And Robert, in your film, you interview some of the very humans who set these events in motion. Tell us about the event that, that set it all in motion and what the man who dropped, I guess, the, 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 socket. the socket felt about it and said about it. Yeah. Uh, they were, the two members of the PTS team were refueling a missile. It was a routine fueling operation when uh, accidentally he dropped the socket uh, that fell and pierced the missile uh, and became a very dangerous situation. It was a very traumatic experience for them. Uh, it was called human error, uh, but in reality, uh, many humans can drop things and make mistakes, but not many have the same consequences where you can blow up the eastern seaboard. Absolutely. Uh, he was very traumatized by the experience, to put it mildly. He lost a friend, uh, actually two friends, uh, and um, he never told his mother until they went to a screening of the film a few weeks ago. You're kidding. Yeah. Oh, so, so that, that shows you yeah. how emotional he was about it. was it. a very emotional experience. and. Uh, it, they're now just starting to get recognition because many of the men that night were really great heroes going back, risking their lives to help save so many of us around the country. Right, they went back into the reactor, right? They went back into the missile into silo the missile that was silo. very dangerous and proved to be incredibly dangerous. Uh, but deadly for one of the men in the crew. Deadly, and it was very, and to help save the warhead that was on top of that missile from right. exploding. It's the irony here is, of course, we build these machines to protect us, and they end up being so easily able to destroy us, especially since they are run or cared by humans. Yeah. We have a sound bite we want to run. Crew is ready. Ready? You had to be prepared to destroy an entire civilization, and we were trained on that. As heartless as it sounds, I never had a problem with it. I was doing it for my country. I was doing it to protect my country. You know, bites like that show how much the nuclear warhead culture is a, is a human culture, right? Yeah. And so how today can we be sure that we're safe? Well, we really can't. And the officer who was talking there, Al Childers, is a wonderful guy. But people need to understand that nuclear deterrence requires you to be willing to use these weapons. And it's your willingness to use them that prevents your adversary from attacking you. Uh, the film that Robbie made isn't an issue film. It's really a thriller. Robbie tried to make a non-fiction thriller that starts with the dropping of this tool and really unfolds over the course of 10 hours. It's about how do you prevent this weapon from going off and destroying this state. But what's useful about the film is that we have 7,000 nuclear weapons. The Russians have about the same number right now. Hundreds and hundreds of them are ready to be used at a moment's notice. And they're not only being operated by fallible human beings, but they were designed 
often with the best of intentions by fallible human beings. And we've sort of forgotten about this whole issue. These weapons are out of sight, literally underground or beneath the sea. So hopefully the film takes, tells a very riveting story, but also is just a, a reminder of these machines quietly sitting there right now as we speak that could go terribly wrong. Now, the film does give us an up-close and personal look at nuclear weaponry. Were you at all fascinated by that before you started the film? Uh, for me, I wasn't an expert like Eric, right. and uh, what made me want to go do the film was that we got the possibility, uh, we were given the chance Access. to go shoot in the only remaining Titan II missile silo, and that was an extraordinary experience. Was it and hard to get that clearance? It, 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 took a little time, yeah. and I don't think the film could have been made without it, but it was the greatest Hollywood set one could ever hope to be on. So yeah, we got to make this, you know, action thriller on this incredible set. So. Now, I also want to ask you, Eric, because you also are the author of Fast Food Nation, Reaper mm. Madness, among others. Mm. How do you choose a topic to delve into? Because they are so different. Yeah. I look for something that is important. Uh, the writers I really admire threw themselves into the important issues of the day. And if it's being well covered in the media, I feel like I don't need to do it. I'm delighted if someone else has written a book on something I'm interested in because then I can just read it mm -hmm. and I don't have to do it. So I try to find things that are important that aren't being discussed, that someone needs to uncover the information. I feel like that's my job and then people can make up their minds what they feel like in a policy sense but we need to have it in the same way we needed to have a discussion about our food system. We need to have a, uh, need to have a national discussion about nuclear weapons and how many do we need, what do we do with them, how are they being operated, and right now that's just not happening. And is there anything else you're working on that you can tell us about? Uh, my next book is on another very cheerful subject. It's on the American prison system. We can't wait for that one. Right now. now I just wanted to say one thing that drew me to this film was the idea that this was covered in the media, but it was not really ever disclosed that this warhead could go off. So on one hand, we have lots of national footage. You see Bill Clinton talking about it, Senator Pryor, but they were not informed of the fact that yeah. the warhead could go this off. This is the scariest nuclear story that you've never heard. You exactly. know, I mean, that, that's why this film is, is so fascinating. Uh, now, Robert, what's next for the film? I know that it premiered with React to Film and PBS on Monday. What's next? Well, we open in theaters tonight, Fantastic. so we're very excited. We open at the Film Forum in New York, uh, and then we roll out across the country starting next week. Robert and Eric, congratulations on the film, and thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Tanya.